the, the standby for all of a sudden, nobody's speaking. Al Smith volunteered, and he's going to speak on, and I'll let him go from there. Al? When I was trying to decide what, what talk I would give, as a member of the Southern Union Veterans of the Civil War, we're preparing to go to Gettysburg in another four weeks in order to participate in the uh, remembrance ceremony that's held in Gettysburg every year. And I decided what's more appropriate than the Gettysburg Address. So I chose the talk that I gave several, well, the last several years I've given it a few times about the Gettysburg Address and its true meaning. Figuring maybe somebody would be interested to learn more about it and would want to sign up for the trip to Gettysburg. So here goes. Abraham Lincoln has been one of the few people in all of our American history that has had such an effect on all of us with the spoken word. In the words of Walt Whitman, famous author and poet, Abraham Lincoln was really one of those characters, the best of which is that the result of long trains is cause and effect needing a certain spaciousness of time, and perhaps even remoteness, to properly enclose them. Having had equal influence on the shaping of this republic, and therefore the world as today, they far more important in the future. Thus the time by no means yet come as though a thorough measurement of him. Nevertheless, we live in, the, in this era who have seen him, heard him, face to face, and are in the midst of all parting strong, strong and strange events which he may have had to do with can in some respects be a valuable, perhaps indispensable testimony concerning him. As with that, that thought, I now tell you the story of Abraham Lincoln and the effect that he had on America and some of the most heartfelt and long-remembered words were ever spoken. In the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg, both sides leaving 23,000 Northern casualties and 28,000 Confederate casualties dead, wounded, or missing behind them. The residents of Gettysburg had little reason to be satisfied with the war, and it turned up their lives. Through all the missed chances, the senseless deaths, the missed opportunities, would give rise to a symbol of national purpose, pride, and ideals. Abraham Lincoln transformed the ugly reality into something rich and strange, and he did it with 272 words. The power of the word has really been given a more compelling demonstration. Village leaders decided that it was necessary to have a consecration of a national cemetery. Pennsylvania Governor, Governor Curtin will ask David Wells, a local Gettysburg attorney, to organize the plans to put into action the dedication of such a cemetery. Wells felt a need for the cipher words to sweeten the poisoned air of Gettysburg. Wells will ask the notable poet, poets of his time, Longfellow, Whittier, and Bryant, during this effort, but sadly, for whatever reason, they said no to the invitation. Not deterred by this refusal, and knowing that the kind of patriotic demonstration would have great power over the audience, he put his efforts into obtaining the abilities of Edward Everett, considered to be the champion in his speech making. Edward Everett was a rare person, a scholar and a diplomat who would be enthralled any mass audience. His voice, diction, and gestures was successfully dramatic. And he performed his well-crafted text, no matter how long, all for memory. Everett was a prime choice for wills. Battlefields were something of a specialty for Everett. He had augmented the fame of Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill by his oratory at those revolutionary sites. Simply to have him speak would add Gettysburg to the sacred roles of names from the founders' battles. With the invitation of Everett as the main speaker, careful negotiations had to be made for the invitation of President Lincoln so as not to insult. No insult was intended, and the importance of inviting federal participation in a state activity was not a major faux pas in the 19th century. President Lincoln was not offended. A solemn ceremony was organized to dedicate the cemetery. President Lincoln was invited to attend and give a few appropriate remarks. There was one, only one oration announced or desired here. Lincoln's contribution was labeled as remarks and was intended to make the dedication formal like a ribbon cutting it, and Lincoln was not expected to talk at length. Lincoln knew the power of the, his rhetoric to, to 
find his warriors. He was seeking to, at this occasion to use his words outside the formal proclamations and reports to Congress. He knew that most of the state governors would be attending or sending important aides, and that that ceremony would also include a large crowd. This was a classic situation for fence mending and intelligent gathering. Lincoln would take with him, take any aides that would circulate and bring back the findings. They would stand and would make their arrangements for the trip, but Lincoln, not wanting to leave anything to chance, countermanded standards. He would say, I do not like this arrangement. I do not wish to go by that the slightest accident we fail entirely. And at the very best, the whole of it to be a mere breathless running of the gauntlet. If Lincoln had not chance to change his schedule, he would most likely have given his speech. The trip from Washington to Gettysburg was some 120 miles, and travel time would have been very hard. Honor of being the main speaker was given to Edward Everett, who responded with a poetic two hour speech. His talk was the kind of speech that would be expected for such an occasion. Edward Everett was a great American statesman and orator from Massachusetts. One of the things I've, I've come to know about the various actions in the Civil War was there was a great many Massachusetts people involved. And Massachusetts was a favorite. Edward Everett was a great American statesman and orator from Massachusetts and would later write to Mr. Lincoln, I should be glad if I would flatter myself that I came to the central idea on the occasion of in two hours as you did in two minutes. It is worthy to note that the strong feeling that, the, that Massachusetts had for Mr. Lincoln and the Civil War was exhibited, exhibited by the words of Charles Sumner and Edward Everett. On June 1st, 1865, Senator Sumner commented on considered the most famous speech by President Lincoln. In his eulogy on the, on the slain president, he called it a monumental act. He said, Lincoln was mistaken that the world will know, will long remember what we say here. Rather than Bostonian remark, the world noted it once in what he said and will never cease to re remember it. The battle itself was less important than the speech. It is worthy to note of the strong feeling that Massachusetts has Mr. Lincoln in the Civil War, as exhibited by the words of Charles Sumner and Edward Everett. The words spoken in Gettysburg are some of the most beautiful words ever spoken, but also offered an eloquent tribute to the soldier heroes who died so that the nation might live. But it was also told that America it must now be dedicated to a new birth of freedom that would guarantee equality and justice for all. Mr. Lincoln's belief that this freedom worth fighting for or even to die for. Abraham Lincoln must be credited for not only writing the poetry of the Gettysburg Address, but also the illegality of the Emancipation Proclamation. These two documents will stand for all time in our American history. A review of certain phrases of the Gettysburg Address will explain why Mr. Lincoln used them. In order to accomplish that purpose, it is important to Enter into the mind of Mr. Lincoln when he composed the Gettysburg Address. Mr. Lincoln's mindset was that he only wanted to make a political statement, but he wanted to make it known of his belief in the equality of all men. The victory at Gettysburg was a positive political victory toward emancipation. It also absolved him from any northern opposition to the war. The sadness of the event left questions in his heart as to how many more men had to die in order to protect the living. Because of this, he thought he wanted the thoughts to be spoken in just the right way. The message that had to be that the soldiers did not die in vain, that they knew what they were fighting for, and that the soldiers' efforts had to be commemorated. He knew that he wanted to what to say, but as according to the paper, he still didn't have it right. Lincoln gets his inspiration from the men who fought, and he does not want to fail them and will rely on the direct source of beliefs. Declaration of Independence, I, I quote in the opening lines from the, both of the Declaration of Independence and the Gettysburg Address. It shows that both documents possess the same inspiration. The Declaration of Independence opens with when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected them and to assume a 
among the powers of the earth, a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and, and nature's God entitle. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the cause which will call them to separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Several theories have been advanced by Lincoln scholars to explain the providence of Lincoln's famous phrase, government of the people, by the people, for the people, and the discussion of more probable origin of the Lincoln Lincoln's words. So let me break down the, the Gettysburg Address and, and, and try to emphasize the, 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 the thought and the meaning of why he used those words. I think a lot of people remember the words anyway. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men What do these words mean? Four score and seven is much more poetic, much more elegant, much more noble than 87. This is fitting because 87 years earlier, the United States won its freedom from Britain, thus embarked on the great experiment. The remainder of Lincoln's opening paragraph reminds listeners of the creation of the United States, noting that its government was based upon the idea of freedom quoting the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. In his opening lines, Lincoln frames his speech in a historical and philosophical perspective, the perfect setup for the next sentence. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation, so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Lincoln signals the challenge principles in which the nation was founded under, founded are under attack. He extends the significance of the fight beyond the borders of the United States. It's not just a question of whether America could survive, but rather a question of whether any nation founded on the same principles could survive. Thus does the war and the importance of winning it take on an even greater significance. We have met on a great battlefield of that war, we have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who gave their lives that this nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. Lincoln turns to recognize that those who have fallen for their country. He uses contrast effectively by stating those here that gave their lives with, that this nation might live makes what is perhaps the ultimate contrast, life versus death. The contrast is compelling. He uses consonants, repetition for the consonant in short succession, three words with the letter F, battlefield, field, final, fitting. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot handle this ground. This paragraph is the most important. Notice of the use of this triple, cannot dedicate, cannot consecrate, cannot hallow. Triples are a powerful public speaking technique that can add power to your words and make them memorable. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. This message is full of solemn respect for those who fought. It is an elegant way of saying that their actions speak louder than words. Lincoln acknowledged that anything said, he says here are just words those words, nothing compared to what the soldiers gave. The world will have little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work to which they nobly fought, who, give, who have thus far given so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that those on the dead, we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave this last full measure of devotion. And we hear how they did resolve that among the dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth to freedom, and that their government by the people, for the people, shall 
my parish was here. And this last paragraph is the most important part. In the first three sentences, Lincoln acknowledges that anything he or anyone else says of this ceremony are just words. And those words are nothing compared to what the soldiers gave during the battle. He and others came to the Gettysburg to dedicate the cemetery ground. And Lincoln turned it around, staging it by struggling and spilling blood and dying on that battlefield. The soldiers themselves have already dedicated, hallowed, and consecrated it, which is essentially to mean to make something sacred or honor in the area. So instead of coming to dedicate the ground, Lincoln says that the people here are dedicated to the unfinished work of the devoted soldiers. That is, the preservation of the Union and the ideals of liberty and of equality. If the Union were to give up on the Civil War, and many people supported making concessions to the South to end the war, then the soldiers' death would have been in vain or meaningless. This is both a call to action and a justification for continuing the war. Now, for the, as far as the Gettysburg Address, the history of the Gettysburg Address, there's only five manuscript copies of the Gettysburg Address that are known to exist. So if you happen to be going through your attic one day looking for a rummage, and you come across the Gettysburg Address, check it out. You may have no mistake. Two of the copies titled the Hay Copy and the Nicolay Copy are in the possession of the Library of Congress. The Bancraft Copy is in the possession of the Cornell University, and the Bliss Copy is on display at the White House. In fact, that was just moved. White House is considered the best of all because it contains the Lincoln signature. The Everett copy is in possession of the State Historical Library. You can learn a lot about public speaking by studying the great speeches of history. The Gettysburg Address is one of the greats. Lincoln took his audience on a journey that began with the founding of America and ended with the crossroads at which the country found itself at that moment. He wanted to make sure that the American chose the right path. Thank you very much.